Welcome, viewers and listeners, to another edition of CHP Talks. I'm here speaking to you from Northern British Columbia, and I'm speaking with Mocha Bazirgan, who is an independent journalist, and he's coming to us from Lethbridge, Alberta, where he's been uh, attending the pre-trial proceedings for the two remaining uh, accused of the Coots Four. And before we uh, talk about that, I'm going to give you a a little introduction to uh, Mocha Bazirgan. Uh, Mocha was born in Constantinople, Istanbul, in 1999. He is Armenian-Canadian. He produced some popular short films in Turkey, which were critical of authoritarianism and promoted the principles of freedom. At the age of 18, he came to Toronto to study broadcasting. He ended up working as a video editor on various documentaries, and he has worked with several conservative-minded media companies. In 2023, he established MediaBazergen.com to provide quality coverage of news that other media shies away from. His last name is spelled B-E-Z-I-R-G-A-N, and we're going to have a link to his uh, his website in the show notes, uh, MediaBazergen.com. Anyway, uh, welcome, Mocha. Thank you for taking the Thank time. You. I know you, you've been uh, at the courthouse all day today, and I guess you have another event to cover before you head back to Calgary. So we'll, we appreciate this time you're spending with us. And uh, what can you tell us uh, uh, today from the uh, pre-trial proceedings that you attended? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you. It's uh, Today was a very important day. It was the first day of pretrial for the Coots 4 after two of the men were released two weeks ago. And many people question how this would affect the pretrial of the remaining two. Would it be positive, negative, what would it look like? And with that in mind, to provide that answer to my audience and to the public, I came down to Let's Bridge. Today, we went through some previously scheduled um, procedures, both sides, both the defense and the prosecutor delivered their arguments. Overall, the supporters who attended the hearing think that the hearing went in favor of the two accused. Now, some of the things I should mention that I think matters is the fact that a huge crowd came, about 100, 250 people, but the main courtroom, the, the largest courtroom in the courthouse of Lethbridge, is under renovation. Now, this is news to everyone. So many people who came couldn't get in and oh. witness the trial. It was only about maybe 15 to 20 people allowed in. Very disappointing. So, yeah, that's... I'm, I'm sure for those, probably people drove long distances to be there to support these two men that are still remain as Chris Carbert and Anthony Olenek, I guess, that are still yeah. uh, behind bars. And, uh, yeah, so that's for those who maybe haven't followed this as closely, the the Coots four, the four men that were arrested over two years ago now. Uh, that's, that's right. It's uh, just over yeah. two years and have been behind bars without bail and without trial and uh, some quite serious uh, accusations originally uh, was... Uh, conspiracy to murder an RCMP, which is uh, pretty pretty uh, high profile and very concerning. However, it's also equally concerning that they've been two years behind bars with no chance to defend themselves, uh, no presentation of evidence, as far as I know. Um, and now just, uh, it was, Mocha, you, you were the reporter on the scene. You were the first person that I heard reporting that the two had, the other two had signed a uh, 
a uh, release, you know, uh, contract. Plea deal. Uh, just they had uh, a plea, a plea bargain, and had been yeah. released. Now, are they completely dropped? Are all the charges uh, against them dropped, or what's happening with the two that were released? Well, for Chris Lysak, the charges of conspiracy to commit murder, okay, the charge of conspiracy to commit murder on RCMP was dropped for both of them, both for Chris Lysak and for Tony, um, his last name now escapes me. Or Jer Jerry Morin? Jerry Morin, sorry, yeah. yes, Jerry Morin. And um, Lysak was... Lysak pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of basically not properly storing his firearm. And Morin pled guilty to trafficking of firearm. Now, many people, the supporters of the man say this was done under coercion because they've been held in remand for two years at least two months in solitary confinement and all these days were counted by the judge as they ser they served and they were released and so they can't sue the government back they can't demand you know compensation they pled guilty to it it's done it's over they're out as a result and the plea deal they got into is public information. So I published it on my website. I think I exclusively obtained the documents from the clerk and published it. Um, some people were asking, well, are they going to, um, you know, take the witness stand against the other two? It, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen based on the deal they um, signed. And, you know, both Lysak and Morin, they are two different individuals and they had two different lesser charges that they pled guilty to. And they both had different lawyers. And so does Chris Carbert and Tony Olinick, who are still remaining behind bars. They also have different lawyers. And, you know, it's not, although they are being tried together, their lawyers have slightly different plans for each because each of their cases their merit the merits are different yeah yeah so um that's quite a thing uh, like first of all it's inconceivable that they would be held that long with neither bail uh nor the opportunity to defend themselves in court and i know that you know i mean i can just imagine you're away from home. You can't work. You can't earn an income. Uh, you, if you have family, then uh, you're away from your family. All these things add up. Do you know if um, they have had access to the Internet while they're in there? I mean, do they have any way of, of following? Like, you know, there's a lot of social media uh, discussion about their case. I know uh, Granny Margaret McKay uh has uh, been a, a great defender of theirs and and others who have you know kept their names uh in front of us in the freedom movement um but uh do they even know that's going on i mean how do they uh they, they can't watch that on the internet so they can't well no based on my knowledge they they pay for some time on iPad, some sort of tablet that they could access to the internet, but they can only access the mainstream media outlets and their apps. So they don't have access to the full internet that we have access to, okay. you know, yeah, beyond bars, but they are being kept informed by mail, by phone calls regularly about what's happening. I'm sure the two men who got released, they must be watching the interviews that were done about them with Tucker Carlson, for example. Right. Or um, yeah, they, they have a lot of lot lot of catch up to do because two years is a very long time. Yeah. Um, so what's your expectation? This was the first day of pretrial proceedings. 
you would think everything that's happened in the last two years would have been pre-trial proceedings. When are we going to get to the trial? How long do you think this process is going to go on? Oh, we, we had pre-trial um, last month, like last couple of months. It was ongoing. <clears throat> it, this was just the first day of pre-trial with only the two men and the other two was released. So many had question marks on how that would affect the pretrial. So that in those terms, it was the first day. But we will see how it goes. Tony Olyanik has a new lawyer. And um, in my opinion, she is articulate, smart, and um, she did a good job. Although I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert, based on the way she defended Defended Olyanik. I think she did a good job. People were satisfied with her. This was her first day in the courthouse. She only had maybe two weeks to prepare. And now, you know, let's not forget the prosecutor, Stephen Johnson, who is a special prosecutor who prosecuted other protesters that participated in that same border blockade, Kutz blockade against COVID-19 mandates. Stephen Johnson also prosecuted Arthur Pawlowski. And we heard from Pawlowski how much of a special prosecutor Mr. Johnson is. And um, to me, to me, it was shocking to see his signature under the plea deal where two of the men got the conspiracy to commit murder charges dropped. And this development was a surprise to everyone but that's what happened and people say well maybe tucker carlson had something to do with do with it he came to he came to alberta asked about it um publicly to premier daniel smith but also at the same time i should really mention this there's another trucker named james sowery who also participated in the same protest protest and on his way back, he ran over a traffic pylon, a traffic cone, at an RCMP checkpoint where one officer with one vehicle standing on the side of the highway felt that Sowery was going to run him over. And his impact statement was very dramatic where, and I'm not saying that in a demeaning way but it made the crowd in the public gallery of the courtroom laugh and basically Sowery right now is serving a prison sentence of 10 months and Sowery has no prior criminal record the judge said that he was satisfied with Sowery having political motivations given his um, opposition to COVID mandates and that he saw the police as the enemy. I'm paraphrasing this part, but basically the judge said that we need to send a message to other like-minded individuals to deter and denounce intimidating police officers. Sowery still maintains his innocence. He's still in prison. And this happened after Tucker's visit. Yeah. So, yeah, basically my point is we might say that had an effect on the two men being released. Well, how do you explain this guy being um, sentenced to 10 months in prison? So two got out, another one sent in prison, and people believe them to be political prisoners because of their involvement in the um, Kutz border blockade. Well, it certainly was the case with uh, Pastor Archer Pawlowski, uh, I mean, there's two independent observers, <laughs> those who aren't caught up in the government narrative. There's no doubt that uh, Arthur Pawlowski was uh, treated the way he was treated because of his um, threat to the political system. And not a, I don't mean a threat of violence, but because <laughs> his uh, preaching and his uh, uh, forthright declaration of of the truth was uh, somehow um, caused them to fear that their narrative was going to fall apart. I think 
and they wanted to get him out of the way. So he spent his 50 some days uh, in prison and uh, a lot of it in solitary and under very uh, terrible conditions, uh, no decent mattress, no decent blankets, uh, you know, and uh, somehow they think this is the justice system in Canada. Um, I'm just going to switch for a minute back to uh, your uh, your own story, uh, Mocha. Um, sure. You were born in Turkey. Uh, did did you spend some time in Canada before moving to Toronto? Uh, like you were, you were back and forth. Yes. You came to Canada to stay uh, in 2018 or when you were 18. Yes. Yeah. So my, my parents immigrated to Toronto um, when I was one years old and I grew up in Toronto until I was six years old. So I went to the first grade, a couple of years in kindergarten and then I went back to Turkey and I was immune to I was automatically immune to state propaganda and um, media propaganda because I could just see okay this is how things are done here <laughs> this is very yeah. different and then you know I automatically I don't know I felt very different and you know I was automatically interested in criticizing and exposing the cultural differences you know things like as simple as crossing from um the pedestrian cross crossway for example uh, in traffic in canada when you step on the road the cars stop for you or the stop signs for example every car stop in turkey that doesn't exist like you have stop signs but nobody stops you have crosswalks but nobody cares about the pedestrian so differences like these, and these are very small differences, but then it gets bigger. For example, everyone believes in free speech. In Turkey, whoever you ask, everyone will say, yeah, we believe in free speech too. Except it doesn't become, they don't consider it criticism of the government free speech. Most people don't consider that free speech. They consider that, that you are being a traitor basically for questioning the government or the president. For example, it's illegal to insult the president. Even if you are criticizing the president, it could be misconstrued as insult and you could be jailed. So many journalists, authors, um, political activists are personally sued by the president in Turkey. So I made short films criticizing all of that craziness. And then I got in trouble. I had to go to the police station twice, give a statement. Um, then when I came to Canada, when I was 18 years old, I came because I thought, you know, I would always talk favorably about Canada and promote Canada and Canadian values of free speech, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. But within a, within a few years, I quickly realized that those are all illusions. It doesn't really exist if it ever existed at some point. And this was a very dark realization and then we all saw what happened with the emergencies act and today many people are disillusioned people are questioning if we have a charter rights of freedom or not because there is there's a lot of confusion about what rights we have and what rights we don't people people today coming to me donating to support my journalism, I get a lot of people who appreciate my work. And most of them are afraid to donate through e-transfer or PayPal or other means through the internet because they are afraid that their banks, bank accounts are going to get seized. Right. Well, we so, have the example that uh, what took place with the Emergencies Act, which yeah. certainly, uh, Justice Mosley has at least come out with the ruling that that was unconstitutional. But we don't know where that's going to go. Uh, the government has vowed to uh, to uh, exactly. appeal that decision. So, but, but that created a trauma. Yeah. The actions of this government created a trauma over Canadian people who care about freedom and who care about, you know, political rights. Sure. So, so um, yeah. What uh, in your development of your what what now is uh, 
basically a, a ministry, a vocation, uh, you know, an avocation. Um, what inspired you to get involved in filmmaking particularly? Like you worked in filmmaking even before you came to Toronto. So yeah. be, under the age of 18, I'm not sure when you started, but but what, what motivated you to get involved in, in filmmaking? Well, because I was immune to the propaganda, I felt a lot of anger and frustration towards the lies that the state, the government, the politicians were telling to the people, to the most vulnerable of the people, to the poorest of the people. And I started criticizing it because I, I converted, basically I converted my anger into productive work into you know making you use of my skills and i continued doing that so it's a way for me to get it out of my system and so and i i'm so angry that i will drive two hours back and forth from calgary to lethbridge the entire week i will drive to regina i will drive to Sask saskatoon i will fly to toronto sleep at the airport or sleep at starbucks I will do all of these things and I've been doing it since last year. That's because that's how angry I am against what this government did, what the lying politicians are doing, the corrupt politicians are doing. And I'll just keep going like this. You know, I'm, I, I know many journalists in this industry, but they, they just sit inside their studios. Whereas the news is outside. The news is happening outside. You got to get outside, right? So yeah. as long I, as I, I know, remain... uh, I know of a particular politician, and I think there were many of them who criticized the uh, Freedom Convoy in while they were in Ottawa, but never went and talked to any of the truckers. Never, never actually walked among the uh, convoy. But they they got their even though they're uh, participating in government. They got their news about what was going on in Ottawa from CBC, which was a slanted uh, version, very, uh, very friendly to the prime minister and his corrupt government. And so uh, they didn't really even they were uh, hundreds of yards from what was going on. But they only re uh, their reaction to it was based on what CBC told them. So I'm thankful that you are out there. Um, I'm going to say, like, uh, you're young, and I thank you, first of all, very much for taking the time to be with us. I've appreciated your work. Uh, in today's world, uh, there's a lot of podcasters, right, um, and independent journalists. I mean, there's a growing number of them. Uh, some are, are better than others, or, or some are uh, uh, more involved with the actual uh, participants in the in the events going on. But uh, I, I've seen you personally at some very important events. Um, how do you manage to define yourself or set yourself apart as a journalist uh, in a in a sea that is full of of budding uh, journalists and podcasters? Uh, you know what kind of things? I, I guess you said already one of those things is just going where the action is and and being there to see for yourself. Uh, what else? What what makes Mocha Bazergan uh, the journalist that everyone should be going to? Well, that's a very good question, a very strong question. Well, I try to stay out of drama. I try to not get into uh, fights with anyone, uh, except when they really, really piss me off. And, you know, I don't go directly, but I go indirectly. I just basically expose them by showing, you know, I'm in the industry of media. So my competition, my competitors are in the media. And and I really get annoyed when um, they act politically. They act based on their political motivations, which is, to me, is shameful because you're supposed to be broadcasting the news. And you're not supposed to omit some significant news that your viewers want to hear, but your paymasters want to bury. 
So I call that editorial corruption. And basically the way I expose that is me by going and covering the news that they will not cover. And everyone sees that, um, that, that difference. So today, as I said, yeah. yeah. So ahead, today sorry. you were in the courtroom again, uh, in Lethbridge and were the two gentlemen, uh, uh, Tony and uh, Chris Garbert, Tony Olenek, Chris Garbert, were they in the courtroom today? They were in the courtroom indeed, and once again, they had shackles on their feet. Yeah. Well, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen Mary Wagner. Uh, you know who that is, uh, and, and Linda Gibbons. I mean, I've seen them put in shackles, and it's so ridiculous. It's uh, dehumanizing. Uh, you know, there could be someone that may needs to be in shackles, but there should be a little bit of common sense in the courtroom, uh, in, in the justice system. So what do you think? Uh, could you pick up from their demeanor in the courtroom what, what their uh, attitude is? Like, uh, how are they feeling about the proceedings? Are they, are they happy to have things finally underway? And uh, do you think they're hopeful about uh, about the future? Well, they seem to be very calm. They usually have a smiling face. Their families are there. The people are there. And they seem to be, I don't know if this is a good thing, but they got used to it. You know, now it's a, you know, you just show up to court. You know, they like the transportation between the remand to the courthouse. That's the very few opportunities they get to see outside it's very brutal, the remand conditions. It would be much, much better conditions if they were actually sentenced to a prison. But yeah, they seem to be okay. I had the chance to speak to Chris Carbert uh, a few, yeah, two weeks ago after the other two were set free. And, you know, based on my um, understanding, the attitude is that, well, we've been here for two years. We could, you know, stick for another two years. We got ne nowhere to go anyway. So, you know, it's 730 days. Almost two years is very serious. And although the pretrial is taking place, it's just the fact that the other two men were released with those serious charges being dropped. That's what brings a lot of big questions into the credi credibility of the crown, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and the, these, the four of them don't have the chance to s communicate with each other. Uh, no. So whatever took place in the plea bargaining and whatever is going on in the minds of these two men that are still in remand, I mean, it must be, that must be frustrating that they can't at least have a discussion, you know, uh, not to, uh, not to get their stories straight, but to just be in communication. I, my understanding from one article that I saw is that they, they didn't really know each other well before the Coots blockade. Two of them maybe were in elementary school together, but but as adult men, they they uh, really met at the at the blockade. So it wasn't like they went there with some uh, prearranged plan or commitment or anything. And and we don't know. Uh, I mean, the the facts we trust will come out in the remaining uh, proceedings. But um, there are. Uh, I understand you're under a number of uh, publication bans. You can't tell us everything that went on there today, uh, but uh, what what can you tell that I haven't uh, asked about yet? Things about the courtroom proceedings and 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 where you see this going. Well, the proceedings will continue. It might end short. They have the whole week booked for this pretrial, but it might end on Thursday. Um, so. There, there is a significant decision being expected for tomorrow 
hopefully that's what everyone is hoping for that will set the tone on what direction the proceedings will go so when that decision happens i will try to report it as much as possible without trying to find out what the publication ban um where the line is because yeah. it's very dangerous if i if they get me you know if i get into trouble with that it's going to be very hard to get information well you you are a professional and you're yeah uh learning as you go and i think you are very uh um you have the integrity to try to wa you. walk the walk as a professional journalist and to report what you can report and we really yeah. appreciate you speaking with us today about this uh i i've i've wished for a long time to speak with someone who was representing the four men uh and mm -hmm. and haven't really found the right person to be able to speak about it. So this is uh, as close as, as I've gotten to getting some direct information. We did send Christmas cards to the four men in Remen, and we got a nice letter back from uh, Tony Olenek, and uh, he sounded in good spirits at that time. That was, uh, you know, closer to, you know, just after Christmas. But um, our hearts are certainly with the men. And we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about what you're seeing in the courtroom in Lethbridge. And uh, we, if there's something else that comes up that you think we should know, I know you'll be reporting on your website, but if you can let me know if there's some significant development, uh, I would appreciate that as well. 100% I will do that. And I would encourage the listeners to check out mediabezergan.com and or my twitter mocha bezergan i will be i am publishing regularly updates interviews and even though i can't report on what goes on the inside you could still get lots of insights on you know what's going on abs on an abstract level whether the proceedings are going in favor of the man or against them so yeah. yeah and you know not i don't think any other media is coming and doing interviews with the members of the public not that i'm aware of so it's valuable coverage so i would encourage people to check it out mocha berzir again uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today keep up your good work and uh god give you strength and uh, wisdom as you navigate the waters of the uh, of the judicial system, which is uh, really in, in deep trouble. Our, our court system, our justice system is in trouble in Canada. And thank you for helping us understand better what's going on and what needs to be corrected. So thanks for your time today. Thank you very, very much for having me. I really enjoyed the interview.